For sample prepping for the SEM, you can have pretty much any kind of sample. Um, you can have a powder, you can have fibers. We sometimes have mounted samples like this that have been polished down. You can also have uh, material or chunks of material um, that you're trying to analyze. For all of these, we're going to mount them onto a stage. Then we're going to verify that there's some sort of electrical conductive path from the sample to the stage. Um, for uh, powders or fibers, what we're going to do is we're going to grab a stage and we're going to use a little bit of double-sided adhesive tape that is also electrically conductive to stick it to our stand, just like these have already been stuck to the stand with that black carbon tape. This is a double-sided tape. Um, with either of these two, we're just going to stick it to the stand and then, like I said, make sure that there's an electrical conduct. Before you start touching anything that's going to go into the SEM, make sure you are wearing clean gloves. Any oils on your fingers are going to cause issues in the SEM. The SEM uh, does everything under vacuum, and if there are oils on the surface, that can cause the vacuum to uh, pump down slower or not even pump down at all. Also, you want to make sure if you've been touching your samples quite a bit, wipe them down with a little bit of acetone, isopropyl alcohol, or ethanol to make sure that those oils have been picked up off the surface and you have a nice clean surface. So in the drawer right here, we've got a container full of all of our stages. These screw stages, so in these two compartments right here, those are the ones that are going to fit best into the TM3030 Plus SEM, our little tabletop one. So you can see it pretty much comes down to two sizes. The screw stages have a little hole in the back of them and that screws into the base of the SEM. And we've got big sizes and small sizes. Choose whatever is going to fit best for your sample. As long as your sample fits within the parameters of this bigger um, stage, as long as it's not bigger than the stage, you'll have no problem seeing the entire surface. If your sample is significantly larger than this stage, you may have to reposition your sample uh, several times in the SEM or cut it down since there are limits on how far in the X and Y directions we can go on the SEM. So we're just going to grab one of these. If I had a powder sample, I would grab a little bit of our adhesive tape right here. We regularly in the lab will have carbon tape and copper tape. This right here is the copper tape, nice copper colored. Both of them are double sided. So here's our copper tape and our carbon tape right here. The carbon tape, if left for longer than about a day, will leave a residue on your sample. So if you have a solid sample like our penny over there and you want to uh, reclaim that sample without any residue, I would recommend using the copper tape. However, the copper tape is not quite as sticky as the carbon tape, so if you are having issues with sticking or you have a very small surface area that's going to be contacting the stage, I would recommend using the stickier tape. Um, also, if you're going to be doing EDS um, and you're trying to do elemental analysis, obviously for a penny, the copper tape would not do well because we're going to get copper from the tape and from the penny. Um, so you want to make sure that whatever elements are introduced to your sample through the tape, whether that be copper or carbon, is not going to cause issues in your elemental analysis. If you don't care about reclaiming your sample and you don't care about EDS, then you can choose either tape. They're pretty much identical. They're both double-sided and they are both um, conductive. So we're going to mount this penny right here, um, but this would be the same for my mounted sample the one that's in resin here. So we're going to take this, we're going to choose whatever side we want to see face up. We'll look at this side here. I'm going to grab a little bit of tape, place it down on the stage, and then we're going to, I'm going to try not to touch the adhesive part because it will lose stickiness over time. And if you're struggling to pull the tape off, we do typically have tweezers in this drawer here, and that can help kind of grab, grab the paper, there we go, and leave the tape down. Another way you can put the tape on that helps is if you fold one end kind of over the edge of the stage. The tape will fold pretty easily, but the paper will not. 
and so sometimes the paper will pop up a little bit when you fold it over the edge. But I'm just going to take my penny, stick it down on here, and I'm going to make sure that there's a nice contact between the two. I don't want this moving, which my penny is obviously a little bit bumpy because it is not sticking perfectly well. If you're having issues with sticking, you can also put a piece of tape over the top to kind of secure it in place. Um, if we were, since a penny is electrically conductive, this is sufficient. When the electrons hit the top surface of our penny, they have somewhere to go. They are going to go through the penny, through the tape, and into the stage. We have a nice electric path through everything. If I was mounting something like this that's mounted in epoxy, the electrons are going to hit this surface, and this is actually a rock, so it's not conductive. There's nothing conductive on this surface here. The electrons are going to hit this surface, and they're going to stay there. We're going to end up with charge buildup, which, in addition to potentially damaging the SEM, can uh, just lead to really crappy images. So what we would do with this one is we would gold sputter it. Typically what I'll do, though, is I will attach it to a stage first. So just like with this penny, I'd attach it to this stage and then run a piece of tape from the surface that we're trying to image, so from the surface of this rock, around to the bottom. So that would look something like this. I'd take my little piece of tape, attach it to the surface I'm trying to look at, kind of bring it down to the side, and then attach it to my stage here. This way, once we gold sputter it, we're gonna have, and I would take this paper off as well, sorry. There we go. This way, when we gold sputter this, we will end up with gold over both the tape and the epoxy and our sample. And the electrons now have a path from the gold into the carbon. They're going to go around the outside and into the stage. So now we have a different path than we had with the penny, but we do have some sort of electrically conductive path for our electrons to go away. That's going to greatly improve your uh, image quality. In all of these cases, the only thing you need to think about when you are prepping your sample is making sure that you have a nice electrical path from the top surface of your sample all the way through to the bottom of the stage. Um, for both of these, these were solid materials. If you have something like a fiber or a powder, typically what we'll do is we will prep the stage just like I've done for the penny, put a little bit of tape down on, whether that be uh, carbon or copper, sorry, backwards there, and then depending on the fineness of your powder or your, um, your fibers, you can either just press them onto the tape or you can sprinkle the powder onto the tape. Um, once you've done that, if you, have a, if you have fibers, they'll stay put. They're usually big enough that you, know, you can see like they're not going to fall off or anything. As I rotate, they just stay put. If you have a powder, what you want to do is tap it lightly, like this, to make sure that any powder that's going to fall off falls off here onto the Kim Wipe, rather than falling off into the SEM. Um, another way you can do that, you can make sure that things are going to not fall off, is to take spatula or tweezers and just kind of like press the powder down into the tape and then shake it off like that. Um, it happens sometimes that people don't want to see a compressed powder, they want to see individual particles. If you want to see individual particles, I would recommend not pressing it down and just sprinkling it really, really lightly over the tape and then tapping it off. That way you're less likely to get powder stuck to powder stuck to powder and kind of get the layers and you're more likely to see individual particles. Once your sample is mounted properly onto whatever stage uh, or size of stage that you'd like, um, and gold sputtered. At this point, we would gold sputter it if we needed to. For the sample, we don't. We're going to put this onto the stand that goes into the SEM. So we're going to open this drawer. Typically, in this drawer, there will be this little black stand as well as this long piece right here. Sometimes these two things get left over next to the SEM itself. So if you don't find it in the drawer, check the SEM, uh, the kind of the desk next to the SEM. This tall piece here is made up of three individual parts. Oops. So we've got kind of this long post right here in the middle. Um, it's got several threads kind of for the bottom half and then this tiny little bit which is going to screw into the bottom of our stage. It has a set screw 
and then it has this base to it. This base is what's going to actually be inserted into the SEM and allow us to move things around. Um, as you can see, this also rotates up and down, changing the height of this piece. So if you have a mounted sample versus a flat sample, you're going to need a very different height to make sure that you have the proper working distance in the SEM. So what we're going to do is we're going to attach your sample to the bottom here of our stage and make sure that it's nice and tight. Then we're going to adjust the height of your sample. So what you want is for the top surface of your sample to be able to pass underneath this black rod without touching it at all. In the case of a sample where there are higher and lower parts, kind of like this penny here, we want to make sure that they're of the highest part can pass properly underneath the um, overhang. Um, within usually a couple millimeters, um, this would be just fine that kind of distance there, and I'll put my hand behind there so you can see that distance. Once you have the right height, you want to make sure that it's not more than a couple millimeters lower than the overhang, and you absolutely want to make sure that it's not higher than the overhang. So once you're confident that this uh, is the right height, and you can do that by rotating up or down, you're going to tighten this set screw. And something you'll notice is when I tighten this, my stage actually moves a little bit. So what I'll often do is I will hold the stage or the post still, and then with another finger I will hold the base still. So the only thing I'm rotating is this set screw. And then just nice and gently, going to give it a little bit of a tighten. This way, when I rotate things um, and I move like the stage and everything, the height isn't going to change, it's just going to rotate the entire assembly. Once we are done with this piece here, we're ready to go over to the SEM. So once you have your sample and your stage all set up, we're going to come over to the instrument. Here's our SEM right here. To the left right here, this little gray piece, and also on top, those are our EDS detectors and the necessary electronics for it. Um, but this whole big blue box, this is the SEM itself. Um, right now it is under a vacuum, and you can tell that because we have a solid blue light under EVAC here. I'm going to press the EVAC air toggle button, and it's going to go flashing to air. Flashing means that it's working toward that state. So to working on introducing air into the chamber. That will take a couple minutes. Once this is solid, we can pull on the handle right here and we'll be able to open this up to put our sample into the SEM. Remember to keep wearing gloves anytime you are touching anything that will go into the SEM. Um, we don't want any finger oils or dirt getting onto this and potentially contaminating the vacuum in our SEM. If you come to the SEM and these lights are both off, that typically means the SEM just hasn't been turned on for the day. The on switch is here, off to the side, on with the line, off with the little circle here. So it should normally be turned on, but if you ever notice that it's off, you can go ahead and turn that on. All right, so now we're solid at air. I'm just gonna open this up. Here are the inside mechanisms of the SEM. So our stage is going to fit right down into this little hole right here. And you'll notice that this piece right here is flush with the bottom. It's not sticking up too high. You want to make sure that it's not sitting up like this. You want to make sure that it's sitting all the way flat down here. If you put it in and it is up a little bit too high, that's probably because of this little set screw right here. This little set screw sometimes uh, wiggles its way inward and prevents the post from sitting all the way down in. In the drawer directly beneath the SEM, in this drawer here, there are uh, little Allen wrenches that you can use to pull that set screw out of your way so that your stage can sit all the way down in. Just so that you know what you're looking at here, 
We've got two knobs on the front that control our X and our Y movement. The left knob is for our X movement, and that is these two posts right here. As I rotate them, you can see these two gears engage, and that moves my stage back and forth on this threaded rod. Um, this threaded rod, this entire machine actually, was a demo piece, meaning that it had been used kind of to travel around the country and show people what these SEMs do before we purchased it. So it did come to us a little bit damaged. This rod in particular, this kind of long threaded rod here, was bent. Um, over the course of time, as we've tried to accommodate for that bent rod, there have been some pieces that have gone missing on the rod. So if you'll notice, there is nothing between the gear head and this, po this uh, I guess, kind of metal wall here. Meaning that if we go too far to one side, these two gear heads will de detach from one another. They'll disengage. So you want to make sure, like I said earlier, that you keep your sample within the confines of this stage. You have plenty of space on this stage where these won't disengage. If your sample is significantly larger and you need to travel a farther distance in the X direction, I would recommend moving your sample so that it is more centered on this post to make sure that you don't ever get to a point where these disengage. If you are traveling in the X direction and suddenly things are free flowing, so this is what it looks like when those disengage, if you are rotating your X axis rod and nothing is happening, that probably means that these have disengaged. Um, you should immediately contact one of the staff who will come and fix this for you. Um, you can see it's a pretty easy mechanical fix. However, for liability reasons, so that you don't have to pay for an entirely new mechanical setup here, um, this needs to be one of our staff that fixes this. Please don't try to fix it yourself. This right here is the Y-axis. It is the right knob, and you can see it's a lot simpler. It's honestly just a straight threaded rod that rotates the stage back and forth. This one has pretty much no issues. It's nice and straight and smooth. Um, if you notice issues, talk to one of the lab staff. Before we close this, we are going to align this little plus sign, and I'll move it out a little bit so you can see better. This little plus sign right here we want to align it into the two grooves that are present um, kind of on the, uh, like the front of the SEM. So we're going to align it just like that. So it sits just nice kind of in those two bumps. What this is going to do is this is going to start us nice and centered in the SEM, meaning that when we, when we close the door, we start up the detector, the detector is going to be looking right in the center of our sample rather than looking somewhere odd in our sample. Because this is completely manually um, operated, there are no electronics that move the stage around. There is no way to return to home if you get lost on your sample. If you have more than one sample on a stage, which you're welcome to do, but if you do, I would recommend taking a picture of it with your phone before closing the door so that you know where things are and what they look like. It can be very easy to get lost in this manual stage if you don't know what you're looking at. And once you're lost, the best way to get unlost is to break vacuum again, realign yourself to center here, and then start over, which is a pretty time consuming process, especially when you have several samples that you're trying to get pictures of. So I would recommend taking a picture with your phone or something like that, or drawing a little diagram so that you know where your samples are before we shut it into the chamber. Okay, now we're gonna close the door. One last check that we wanna do before we put the sample in the chamber is we're gonna watch this as I close it to make sure that it does not hit this little overhang right here. As long as it passes safely through here, right here, then we are go then we know that it's going to be a safe height um, in the SEM. So we're just going to watch as that goes through, make sure that that pro passes properly underneath without bumping into it. If it bumps into it, there are two things you need to check. One is you need to check that this piece is not accidentally sitting too high up. The other thing that you want to check is that your sample is the right height, that it passes under that black overhang on its little stand. Okay, now we'll close this 
I'm going to hold it with my hand, just give it a little pressure. You can see it wiggles. The whole thing is actually, um, in order to keep uh, vibrations from like the table or from the walls from interfering with our imaging, the whole thing has a nice suspension system. So you can see it wiggles. But I'm just going to give a little push right here and press evac air. You will hear the little vacuum on the floor start up. After about five seconds, the vacuum will start to get quieter and the pitch will start to lower, at which point you are good to release pressure. But for the first five or so seconds, you want to put pressure on here to make sure that a good seal is created as this is pumping down. Now there's a lot in the chamber and it tries to pump down to a pretty, uh, pretty powerful vacuum. So this will take several minutes. This is a bit of a long process. So once your sample is in the SEM, this right here is the imaging software. It's just called TM3030 Plus and it's here on the desktop. Um, if the computer is not turned on when you first get into the lab, uh, talk to one of the staff, we can turn it on for you. The tower to this computer is actually attached to the back of the monitor and it's kind of unusual looking. If you are able to figure out where the um, power switch is, you're also welcome to turn it on yourself. Um, it shouldn't prompt you for a password um, to the account that we're logged into here. If it asks for a password, you're on the wrong account. We have three different accounts, two admin accounts, and kind of a general user account. The general user account does not need a password, so you should be able to get to this screen with zero passwords. Okay, so you can see it is still working on evacuating the chamber, and then that just went away. Um, that was this software here that got started up. When the SEM is actively working toward vacuum or working toward air, so we had that flashing light, this is going to have that little dialog box that pops up. Um, it won't let you do anything else on the uh, software. Before we click start to turn on the um, electron beam, we are going to set these parameters down here. If you have a conductive sample, you'll want 15 kV. If you have a less conductive sample, you will want 5 kV. We have three different modes for 5 kV. Low magnification, if I click it again, you can see that little green light moves. Mid magnification, and then high magnification. Because 5 kV is a pretty low voltage, we tend to get, well, it tends to be a little harder to get high resolution images at high magnifications. So this changes the beam size on the actual sample so that you have more electrons hitting a smaller area for the high magnification. That helps you get a better, um, a better image even though you have a lower accelerating voltage. 5 kV is just fine if you are trying to image, um, like I said, anything that's not conductive, uh, ceramics or organics. Um, However, you're not going to be able to zoom in quite as far. If you're trying to look for elemental analysis or you're trying to get really high magnification images, I would recommend gold sputtering before coming here so that you can use 15 kV without worrying about charge buildup. So 15 kV, we're going to use that since we're looking at a penny here, we're going to use 15 kV. This third mode is EDX. It is almost identical to 15 kV except it has a slightly higher uh, current than 15 kV does. So what that means is it's higher energy electrons and they are, there are more of them, more electrons. Because of that, we're able to get better EDS signal from, uh, from our sample. So if you are going to be using Pathfinder, which I will go over in a minute, um, you'd want to be in EDX mode but for imaging, 5 kV or 15 kV. If you're not sure which one is gonna work, start with 5 kV, um, you know, move around, focus, see if that's gonna do enough. If you're not getting great images with 5 kV, then try 15 kV. We always wanna start as, you know, the lower if you are unsure, uncertain. I am certain about this one, that 15 kV is the right choice, so we'll start with it. The other thing that we wanna set is which detector we are looking through. We have two different detectors um, that are detecting electrons and a third detector if you count the EDS detector. 
The first detector here is the Backscatter Electron BSE detector. Um, this is going to show you composition differences. So if you have uh, copper next to carbon, you're going to see light and dark with the two different elements. Um, the lighter, the brighter colored the element is on the actual screen over here, that means that it is a heavier element. Darker elements are uh, less heavy or lighter elements. So carbon typically shows up as a very dark black because it's a very light element. Something like copper or iron, which are both heavier, are going to show up brighter. You can see there are three lights in here. The first light is for conductor. So if you know that your sample is electrically conductive, you want to be in conductor mode. If your sample is not a great conductor, but it is not an insulator, um, then you'd be in standard. That's the most commonly used. And the third is charge up reduction. Um, I'm going to move off of charge up reduction because charge up reduction is um, actually a lower vacuum mode where you have a little bit of air in the sample chamber instead of having a near perfect vacuum. Um, by having that air in there, it actually keeps us from getting so much charge buildup. It does, however, limit our ability to get signal from the sample. So if you have an organic sample, um, charge up reduction is awesome. However, if you're trying to do EDX um, or you have, uh, you're looking for really high magnifications, charge up reduction is not going to be very helpful. Next is secondary electron or SE. This is going to show you topography right here. Um, again, we have a couple of options on this one. The only difference between backscatter and secondary <clears throat> as far as these options is we don't have the, uh, the conductor mode. So we have standard and we have charge up reduction. Standard means that we have the regular vacuum and that's true for both of these. Um, <clears throat> when you switch from standard to charge up reduction or back the other way, you want to give it two to three minutes um, before you start taking images because it's going to take a little bit of time for the vacuum to stabilize or for the pressure to stabilize as you move back and forth. So I'm going to keep it in standard from this point forward. Um, but if you do switch back and forth, you want to give it a couple minutes so that the machine can re uh, reach a nice stable position. The last one here is mix. This is an overlay of both secondary and backscatter modes. This is really helpful if you have both topography and composition that are interesting to you. Um, for example, if you have some sort of sample with a bunch of pores and you suspect that there is residue in the bottom of those pores, the residue question would be something about backscatter, but determining where the bottom of a pore is would be a topographical matter. So that would be a good job for mix. You can see these two lights. Mix has the same two lights as secondary. The middle one is standard, the bottom one is charge up reduction. So I'm looking at a penny here. Um, the surface of the penny is going to be pretty much all copper. Um, so backscatter is not going to be very interesting for this particular sample. I'm going to stick with my secondary mode um, so that I can see the topography on the surface of the penny, scratches and indentations and such. So this was all before I clicked start. Here is start. So now that I have those parameters set the way I want to, I'm going to click start and I'll bring that to the center. What it's going to do is it's going to give us just sort of an auto start. Auto start is going to adjust our brightness, our contrast, and our focus to the best of the software's ability. That is not always sufficient. Sometimes it fails um, at focusing properly on our sample, but we will see what it gives us. It's trying, it's trying its best. All right, so we do, we can see a little bit. So I'm gonna move to somewhere where it's a little more interesting, and then I will go through how to make sure that this is what we want. So you can see E Pluribus Unum, or the middle bit of that from our penny. You can also see a couple of little lines down here um, from kind of the, the shape of the shield, I guess, that's kind of underneath that in the penny. 
So I know that I started right in the middle of my penny. So as I move around on the surface, um, I know that down here is approximately the middle. And as I move up, I'm moving toward the top of the penny. As I move down, I'm moving toward the bottom. Okay, here are a couple options here. So these are called rasterizing speeds right here. Fast means, do you see that line that's going kind of over the surface here? That is your rasterizing line. A uh, scanning electron microscope, which is what SEM stands for, is scanning over the surface. When it scans quickly, it does not give you as much information, so it kind of looks like a snowy or a, a kind of a rough picture, but it updates quickly. So if I move, you can see that updates pretty quickly. Slow is a slower scan. You can see that line moving more slowly. However, we're going to get more detail on the surface. So you can see a little bit better because now it is looking a little bit more closely. It can give more information. However, if I move while this is coming down, I'll show you what the text looks like. It kind of distorts my image because it's not updating quite as quickly. Now as it comes down, since I've stopped moving, it's going to look normal again. Fast is great for when you are changing any of the parameters or changing your location on the sample. Slow is great for once you're in the location you want to see, looking for details or investigating particular um, features on the surface. Reduce is a little bit faster than fast, but over a smaller image. So this updates even more quickly, but it does look even more snowy. And the last one is freeze. That's just going to freeze whatever is on the screen. A lot of people find these refresh lines to be a little bit um, distracting. So freeze will get rid of those lines. However, that means that we're not updating. So no matter how much I move around, I'm not going to see any change to this image. There is an option, or not an option, a feature on this SEM where if freeze is turned on for five minutes or more, it will automatically turn off the electron beam. So beware of that if it's in freeze mode. I'm going to put it into fast and we're going to find something that we like. So using these two knobs right here, we can move left and right with this and up and down with this one. And there are arrows on the front of the door to show you which one is which. Left, right, up, down. It does take a little bit of getting used to, um, but you want to make sure you know, you're moving slowly. Try not to um, crank these too quickly. Um, also, if you feel any resistance on either of these, do not force it. That probably, if, there, if you're feeling some sort of resistance, probably it's because you've reached the end of those threads that you saw in there, or because something is stuck. In both cases, you really just don't want to force it. So as long as these are moving smoothly, you're good to go. So I'm going to kind of just wander around the surface of my sample um, in order to find something that I like. So I like this spot right here. I want to take a closer look at this U right here. So I've centered that as well as I can on the screen. We can change the magnification so we can zoom in and out on our sample. You can do so by clicking the plus and the minus buttons. You can also do it by clicking on our presets. So we can jump to 500 or 1000 X. The software will actually allow you to go all the way to 60,000, I believe. Um, you have to have a very well aligned sample and a very new um, set of apertures in the SEM for us to accurately achieve that. Um, but we can pretty regularly on good conductive samples reach several thousands of uh, times magnification. A faster way, if you know you want to zoom in quickly, is to hover your mouse over the middle of the magnification button, click and hold, and then drag to the side. And you can see that changes very quickly. I jumped up to 7,000 very quickly, and you can see here on the screen we've zoomed in. You can also zoom all the way out by going the other direction.
So by dragging toward the minus sign, we zoom out. By dragging toward the plus sign, we zoom in. And you can see I can pull my mouse off the software and it does not matter. So what I'm gonna do first thing is I'm gonna zoom in until I can see contrast like this, but the contrast is kind of blurry. So I'm not really, I mean, I know that I'm looking at scratches because I know my sample, but the scratches aren't really well defined. So we're zooming in kind of to a place where I've got that contrast and there's contrast in here, but things aren't very clear. At this point, I'm going to adjust my focus. Focus are these two buttons right here. We've got an autofocus feature, which works when you are zoomed out to a thousand or smaller. We are at 18,000 here, so the autofocus would maybe work and maybe not. Here is the manual focus. Just like with the ma magnification, we can click on the plus signs and the minus signs, and you can see things are kind of changing on my screen as I do that. Actually, I went way out of focus here. Um, a much faster way, since you can see this is very slow going here, is to grab in the middle and drag left and right. And you can see that focus changing. So this is very clearly out of focus. My uh, contrast right here is a little bit fuzzier. And then I'm gonna drag the other direction. This is fairly well in focus, about right here. And if I go to the other side, we can see now we're back out of focus. We've lost our features here. So I'm gonna drag to about the middle of those two locations to kind of find where I have the most contrast. Now it's been a little while at this point since the apertures were changed. Um, the apertures are what helps focus the electron beam. It's also been a little while since the filament was changed, meaning that there is going to be, at some point, a limit on the magnification we can achieve. Um, we've kind of hit that limit. If you start and you have no focus whatsoever, what you want to do is zoom as far out as you can, focus to something like this. So in that case, we would make big, wide, sweeping motions to see what is and is not in focus. Once you have it as good as you can get, you zoom in. Until things are contrasted but fuzzy. You focus again, kind of going back and forth between out of focus and in focus on both sides. And you kind of swing till you find the middle. And then we zoom in again and we try to refine the picture just a little bit. And you can see as I get to higher magnifications, I'm making smaller movements with my mouse. When I am zoomed way far in and I have as good a focus as I can, as I can get, when I zoom out, I'm going to have a lot more clarity on the little features that are on the surface here. As I zoom out, I do not need to change the focus because I know as long as I do not move from this location, I am as focused as I can be. Now, if I have a non-flat surface and I move to the other side of my sample, I am going to need to refocus because now the sample is closer or farther away from the detector and we'll need to redo the focus. Another thing that we can adjust, or another couple things that we can adjust, and these are mostly cosmetic, we can adjust brightness and contrast. Um, for some people, this snow is really distracting. When you move it to slow, you're going to get less of it, but we do sort of have this um, snow here. That's usually a contrast issue. Um, we are trying to falsify contrast that doesn't actually exist. So I could lower the contrast somewhat. That will make my darks a little lighter and my lights a little darker. If you have completely whited out or completely blacked out sections, for example, if I had something, that's oh, not even gonna do it because this is a pretty flat surface. But you can see I have bits of white along here and I have bits that are very, very dark in here. You should never have anything that's completely whited out the screen or completely blacked out the screen. You should have grays across the entirety. 
Um, that's just for publication grade images. You should not have any completely whited out or blacked out sections. Also because that'll waste your ink, and that's a bummer. So I'm going to move my contrast a little bit more central, and you can see on this green bar that I'm about middle of my contrast. We also can adjust the brightness and contrast. Some people really prefer very dark images. Um, and depending on the features you're looking at, sometimes having a very dark image helps you see things better. Um, some people prefer a much lighter image. Um, again, depending on your application or you know, what you're using these images for, you can choose. Um, dark images are a real pain to print and often don't come out looking nice in printed publications. Um, however, they are just fine on like electronic images usually, um, if you're sending things electronically. So that is up to you. The auto brightness contrast feature right here is okay. Um, I don't always agree with its choices, but it can be a good start sometimes. Another cosmetic thing that you can do is rotate your sample. So I'm going to zoom back out. We are looking at lettering here. Let's move. Let's say I just wanted a picture of this E for my poster or something. So this E is a little bit crooked and that's because we are on the curved edge of the penny. What I can do is I can rotate, these outer ones are presets, so I can rotate 90 degrees. Um, or this bottom one will rotate 180 all at once. Or this one will rotate 270 all at once. By clicking this top one, it'll bring you back to normal. These are all just digital rotations, nothing is physically happening to your sample. You also can rotate by degrees by clicking and holding on this little plus sign. So I can rotate this until the two lines are approximately parallel with the top and the bottom of my screen. And there I have a rotated E. If I click back to this button here, the very top button, it will reset my rotation to whatever is true rotation on your sample. So now my sample is, this is how my sample is upright. Something to be aware of is if you rotate by 90, um, or any of these rotations here, all of a sudden your X and Y knobs on the SEM themselves are going to be off. So now your X is your Y and your Y is your X. As I move up and down, I am actually physically going to need to move the sample left and right. Um, so that can get really confusing if you rotate and then try to maneuver around your sample. I would recommend staying in the same place um, and not maneuvering while you're trying to rotate. The last button that I haven't really talked about here for cosmetic changes is this reset image shift. I'm going to zoom in here. So here is a section of my E. You can see that this is not quite centered but let's say I really was interested in this kind of T section right here. As long as the distance between the thing I want to see and the center of the screen is less than 50 microns, which this scale bar down here um, will tell us how far it is. So this whole range is 200 microns, meaning the distance from here to here is smaller than 200 microns. Um, sorry, I think I said 50 microns. I believe it's 500, actually. Um, so as long as this distance is less than 500, I may be misspeaking. We'll see. As long as this distance is smaller than a certain number, if I double click on the thing, it will bring that centered. Um, now, this is not, again, this is just cosmetic. Nothing is physically happening to your sample. So what we've done is we've just told the detector to readjust what it calls center. What we are seeing here is not the center of the electron beam, and so the focus is not going to be as good as the center of the electron beam, especially if we have a low accelerating voltage like 5 kV. But that allows me to take a nice picture with my relevant uh, feature centered on the screen. Again, this is great for publications, so you don't have to worry about things being off-center or making tiny adjustments to bring things to center. 
This is called image shift. To go back to true center, we click reset, and that'll put that back where it truly is. If we're way zoomed out and I try to bring this L to center, we will get an error. Okay, so it is 50 microns. Um, the amount of image shift can must be 50 microns or smaller um, in order for you to do that shift. At that point, if it's larger than 50 microns that you need to move, you can just use the knobs. And that will be plenty sufficient. Okay. Once you are happy with what you're looking at, you have focused it, you're satisfied with whatever brightness level you're using, um, I would recommend putting it into slow to verify that you're seeing what you want to, since fast is um, pretty difficult to see. Um, you're not required to put it into slow mode, you can do what you want. But now we're ready to take our image. We have two options for that. Quick save is going to take whatever's on the screen. If I am in fast mode, it will take this picture. If I am in reduce, it will take this picture. If I'm in slow, it will take this picture. So quick save, really the, the resolution on that image is a function of what you see on the screen. So I would always recommend doing that in slow. Quick save is fairly quick. It'll take only a couple of seconds and then it'll pop up uh, a prompt to save that image. Save itself is a little bit slower than the slow rasterizing speed and is going to take a really nice high quality image. Right now I'm zoomed out to 180, so vibrations are not going to be a big deal. Um, but a pretty common issue is if you are zoomed in and you choose save and I decide to shake the table, you will end up with vibrations and you can see them a little bit here. Um, I'm happy to zoom in on those um, when we get the image actually done, but you will see vibrations. If you are a leg jiggler, if you are a fidgeter, something like that, step away from the desk while you are taking a save, especially at higher magnifications, a thousand or higher, um, you have the potential to see these vibrations. Um, I will show you the vibrations in a second. First I'll show you how to save. So normally, um, underneath this PC, you will find a drive like this. This is common to most of the computers in the lab. It's called MCL, um, and then you've got the directory here. Um, this is a network drive that connects most of our machines to one another, meaning that we have a central location to save the data. If this is logged in, awesome. If this is not logged in and there is a staff present in the lab at the time, talk to one of the staff and they will happily log in for you. If this is not logged in and there are no staff present in the lab, save your information to the desktop. Um, there will either be a folder called temporary user data, or you can create one with just your name and the date or something that says temporary and your name or the project name. Um, when staff come back into the lab and log into that network for you, they will drag the information from the desktop into this, uh, this folder right here. So assuming that you can save to the network, um, under the main parent folder, we have a list of all of the machines that we have or have had in the MCL. What you'll want to do is find the machine that you're on. So we're on the TM3030 plus SEM. Open that up. We have two folders under here called user data and manuals. Underneath the manuals, that's going to be information like how to use the software um, and some software files. Um, user data right here is a list of people who have used this machine and their particular folders. If you've used it before, go ahead and save to your folder. Um, if you have lab mates who have used it, you can also save to their name. If you have not used this before and you want to create your own directory, you click new folder, type in whatever name. You can see some people use personal names, some people use tech uh, uh, or company names. And I will find mine, here's me. 
and within your folder you can organize however you would like. Um, you can create folders based on the project or the date. You also can just save things to, you know, wherever you'd like. So we'll name this folder training. And we're going to give this uh, image a name. Most people find it useful to save with the name of the sample, something with three items. The name of the sample, something that tells us where you are on the sample, and a magnification. Um, you are welcome to save with whatever naming convention you would like. I would call this penny underscore 4000x. Um, and if I cared that this was the back of the penny versus the front of the penny, I could specify that. If I cared that this was on the top rather than the bottom of the penny, um, as far as kind of in the, the flat plane, I could specify that. Just kind of name it however is going to be most useful to you, and then click Save. I am now going to go into my folder. Remember, this PC, we've got the network location. We go to the instrument. We go to user data. And then we find my folder here. And it has saved a JPEG file. It's also saved a text document. Most people don't find the text document particularly useful, but it does have things on here such as what magnification you were using, what working distance you were using, the um, brightness and contrast values, which don't translate to anything, but that can help you compare images to each other. Um, it'll have other things in here such as date, um, here's the accelerating voltage that we were using, the working distance. So most people, don't, like I said, don't find this very useful, but it exists if you want it. And then I'm going to open up our JPEG here. So this was, I wanted to show you the vibrations. So right here, if you look all along here, instead of kind of having these nice round um, kind of looking images, we have pretty serious vibrations and it's most clear in this scratch, especially right here. You can see those uh, vibrations. You can also actually see them all the way along. Let me see if zooming in anymore. I'm afraid it's going to get really fuzzy, but you can kind of see lines along here and I apologize if you can't. On the main screen you can actually see it, um, but we've got these zigzags here and that's because I was shaking the table while it was trying to take this image. So this is where, oops, haha. This is where I was talking about you want to make sure that you step away from the uh, desk, especially if you're taking high magnification images with the slower save mode. Now, I just got a little uh, dialog box that popped up in front, you saw that. That said that freeze mode had continued for more than five minutes. I warned you about this, I warned us about this earlier. Um, when you take an image, freeze will automatically turn on. It has been approximately five minutes since I saved that image, since I was showing you about the directory and all of that. So it turned off our electron beam for us. Unfortunately, that means we have to click start. It's going to go back through its auto focus and auto start measures. So any brightness or contrast changes or any focus adjustments that we made may be undone which is a little unfortunate, but, um, you know, that's my bad for not paying attention to how long Freeze had been on. Um, we're going to see if autofocus does anything here. I am zoomed in past a thousand, so like I said, sometimes it fails, and I probably should have zoomed out a little bit before I did an autofocus. Yeah, absolutely should have zoomed out. Look at that. It failed miserably. I'll try again. There is also not a lot of contrast on this image, so, or on this particular sample. Let's see if that helps slightly. Yeah, it's a little better. Um, because autofocus is only so-so, at this point I would want to do my um, zoom, focus, zoom, focus, zoom, focus kind of cycle, where I make sure that I'm at the best focus I can be, and then I zoom in a little bit farther. 
um, making sure that things are as sharp or my edges are as sharp as they can be and my contrast is as sharp as they can be um, before I zoom in a little farther. At this point, you have all of the information that you need to go around and take whatever pictures you want to take on the, um, on the surface of your sample. It does take a little bit of elbow and wrist grease in order to move far distances on the sample. Um, you can see we don't move very quickly despite my hands moving quite a bit. So you do have to kind of be careful, you know, that you're being patient with your movements here. Um, before we move on, I guess I'll just show you really quickly what a backscatter image would look like on this. So we mostly have bumps on the surface, which is why I chose secondary. Um, but backscatter is going to pull out these. You can see that we have a lot flatter looking surface. We can't see these edges quite as well as we could previously. You can't tell that those are bumped up versus bumped down. However, we get these really dark spots, which are most likely bits of carbon um, from people touching the surface or even dust having fallen on the surface here. Those dark spots, um, as I mentioned earlier, that means it is a lighter weight element, lighter mass. The brighter areas in the back are probably the copper of the penny. That being a heavier element, it's going to be a brighter white on here. So that's kind of just the little difference between backscatter and secondary. Backscatter I find very useful if you are trying to do elemental analysis, which we will go into next. So once you're done with your SEM uh, imaging or your EDS imaging, what you're gonna do is you're gonna click this button which says stop. Um, I have already done that. When you click stop, you wanna make a note of the time. Uh, currently 4.04. It was four o'clock when I clicked stop earlier. Um, what you wanna do is wait two full minutes from when you click stop before you open up the chamber. While you've been imaging, the filament gets really hot. If we introduce air at this point, then oxides are likely to form on the surface of our tungsten filament. That dramatically reduces the lifespan of our filament and increases downtime, meaning you're not gonna be able to access the machine as frequently because it will need a lot more maintenance. So we hit stop, we make a note of the time, after two minutes has passed, then we can come over here, press our toggle button, and send it to air. Um, there is a notice here, please wait two full minutes after stopping the beam before breaking vacuum. So that's what that's referring to. Um, we have had people mistake this to mean you click stop, you, e you click evac, and then you wait two minutes to open. That is not accurate. What you wanna do is stop, then wait two minutes, then introduce air. So you want to make sure that you've had a chance for the filament to cool down before allowing any sort of air into the chamber. While this is pumping down, put on a pair of gloves so that, um, so that when you pull your sample out, you are uh, not touching any of the sample pieces with oily fingers. And once that air light is solid, we are good to open up the door, pull the sample out, close the door, and put this back under vacuum. The SEM should always be left under vacuum when it is being not when it's not being used. If you are just going to swap this sample out for another one and you're coming back within the next, say, minute or two, you are welcome to leave this under air. When you are done with your scheduled time, or if you're going to be leaving this for more than a couple of minutes, please place it back under vacuum. Remember, keep pressure on this for approximately the first five seconds after you press evac. Once the vacuum on the floor starts to get a little quieter and the pitch lowers, you are welcome to let go and uh, let it continue its evacuation. Now with this, we're going to head back over to the sample prep room, tear it all apart, and put the pieces back where they belong. Now that we are back in the sample prep room here, I'm going to take the stage 
off of the base. So now we are just down to the post, the uh, set screw, and sort of the base piece here. I'm gonna put that into the drawer on top of the black stand. Um, some people do put it here. I would prefer that it stay on the black stand here. Um, probably gonna grab some tweezers. I'm going to pull my sample off of the tape. As I mentioned earlier, the carbon tape is a lot stickier than the copper tape. So depending on your sample, you may have to pry it off. If you have a very thin ceramic or a very brittle material, um, often we will see samples break as they come off of the uh, carbon tape. So just be aware of that. Slide under it as carefully as you need to. Um, there's usually a sharp object in here. Nope, no razors in here today. Um, if you need a razor to help pry your sample off, there is a red toolbox in this same room where we are, and you can um, go into that toolbox to grab a razor. Make sure to put it back when you are done. Now my sample's off. I'm gonna make sure that there is no tape on the surface here. And pull that off, there we go. And with this clean, if by accident, if I maybe forgot that and I touched this with my hands at some point, I would go find some ethanol, acetone, or isopropyl alcohol to wipe off this surface because I've only touched this with gloves and because it was pretty much just the tape on it, I'm gonna just put this right back into the container. This is a large screw stage, so it's gonna go in this compartment right here. Please do your best to keep this organized. Um, large stages, small stages, that's pretty much all you're going to have used. Go ahead and close this up and just replace any tools that you used or borrowed during your time here. As a reminder, push your chairs back under the desk, throw away all used Kim wipes and gloves, and take your samples with you as you leave. Please also remember to not use any personal USB sticks in the lab computers. To save your results, if the computer is connected to the internet, open Google Chrome, go to gmail.com, and email the results to yourself using the lab account. If the lab account is logged out, please ask staff to log you in. If no staff are present, a personal account may be used. Please do not log out of the lab account. If the computer is not connected to the internet, find an MCL-owned USB, usually a metallic blue color. Copy your data from the computer onto the USB, then use any internet-connected computer in the lab to email the data to yourself. Please do not put the MCL USBs into your personal computer. Once you have completed this training video, email lab staff at characterization.uofu at gmail.com to schedule a one-hour follow-up training session called an observation. Bring your sample to the MCL at the scheduled time, and staff will watch and assist as needed for the first hour of your machine use. After you have successfully completed the observation hour, you are authorized to schedule time on this machine in the MCL for independent use.